All right. I have never spoken in front of this many people before. <laughs> Get used to it. I'm working on it. Anyway, <laughs> welcome to the Alpha and the Omega Conference. I'm, I'm glad you could make it, and thank you for coming. Tonight, we're going to talk about the creation, the, catas the curse, and the catastrophe. My name is John Howe, and I've been studying creation for just over a year now, but that's more than enough time to realize that for in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in the midst, Exodus 2011. I've come to the conclusion that the Bible is truly the infallible word of the living God. It has revealed secrets, from, secrets that only recently top scientists have been able to figure out, and some we still can't figure out. I think in the bottom of everyone's heart we all know there is a creator, but many do not like the idea of a creator because it implies accountability so they accept a totally illogical alternative. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie. God has built this universe in such a way to, to prove his existence. The heavens declare the glory of God, Psalm 19.1. And you're ignoring that isn't going to change the fact. But the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Without excuse. The facts are here, God is real, heaven and hell are real, and to choose not to believe in them isn't going to help anyone at all. So let's get started. I believe in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and I believe that because that's exactly what the evidence points to. There are tons of compromised positions to creation, but I do not accept compromise to the word of God. I'm going to go through as best I know how and break down the original creation and what has happened to it since the beginning, and back it all up with real evidence and scripture. I chose to speak about the subject specifically because not enough people truly understand the creation story. So from a, from a Christian perspective, we're unprepared, and from a secular perspective, they've only been taught one side, that's indoctrination, not education. Obviously, I can't get to every single point tonight, but I will hit as many as I possibly can. I'm sorry if I talk very fast, too, by the way. <laughs> um, if you'd like to research further, I would strongly recommend Kent Hovind's material. I know he's controversial, a lot of people don't like him. I don't care, the information's still good. And if that isn't enough for you, here's a short list of some other people that have also given me some, some very good information. So let's get started. Why does it matter who or what created everything and why does it matter how? God tells us to know and understand the world around us. I applied mine heart to know and to search and to seek out wisdom in the reason of things, Ecclesiastes 7.25. God wants us to be able to answer the atheist questions. Be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks the reason of the hope that is in you. I'm sorry, I have a speech impediment and I don't breathe when I speak. <laughs> anyway, his word says to study so that he will be pleased with us. Study to show thyself approved unto God. So, if the Bible means anything to you, there are some pretty good reasons, and if that, if you don't care, then just using logic, if part of the Bible is wrong, how can you say any of it is right? To have millions or billions of years in creation would mean you would have to have death before sin. This is a clear contradiction to what the Bible says. It, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians, for by, for by man came death, and Adam all died. Death entered the world and sinned it in the Garden of Eden. Jesus quoted Genesis 25 times, and almost every other book of the Bible refers back to Genesis at some point. It's an important topic. And there's no reason not to believe the Bible. It has never been proven wrong, unlike the contrary theory that is being proven wrong on a regular basis. And by the way, this, this is why I use the King James Version of the Bible. I, I know, know no, no one likes it. it. The, thou, it's hard to read, I know. But the fact is, it's, it's really the only one that really gets it right. So, now I, I know a lot of people, most people I know prefer the NIV. So if you have an NIV, please open with me to Acts 837. I'll save you some time. It's not there. <laughs> that verse just does not exist in the NIV translation, and there's a lot more, a lot more of them than that, just, just that one. And for the verses that did survive, let's take a look at, for example, Hosea 1112. King James, Judah yet ruleth with God. NIV, Judah is unruly against God. Would you say that's saying the same thing? I, I, no, not me. Another example, Proverbs 18.24. A, a man that hath friends must show himself friendly, King James. One who has unreliable friends soon, soon comes to ruin, NIV. 
that's this is a two-pointer. That's first of all not the same thing, obviously. <laughs> and second of all, that's what the NIV says now. If you have an older NIV, it looks a little more like that. Minor difference, no big deal. But the point is, the Bible, the Word of God, does not need to be updated. He got it right the first time. Anyway, let's get to what we came here for. Part one, the creation. Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Let's stop. Okay. This, this is seriously, this is probably the most fascinating verse in the Bible, I think. For a lot of reasons, but let me share with you the thing that I think is the most fascinating. See, in the beginning, that's time, God created heaven, that's space, and the earth, that's matter. But it gets better. Time consists of past, present, and future. Space consists of height, length, and depth. And matter consists of solid, liquid, and gas. In the first verse of the Bible, the very first thing God did, he created a trinity of trinities that we all live with every day. We need to live with. That, that just blows my mind. I just, I just, wow. Anyway, verse 2. And the earth was without form and void, and dark, darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Let's stop again. <laughs> the Bible says quite clearly right here and in other places, the earth was formed underwater. Now, in your high school textbook, it probably said something along the lines of the earth was formed through millions of years of hot molten rock. Who's right? Well, if you take a look at granite under a microscope, you'll find these little radio polonium halos. These halos have a very short half-life of about three minutes. The fact that they exist tells us that the rock had to be formed in much less than three minutes or these would have dissipated. Another interesting fact here, too, if you take granite and melt it down and then let it reharden, it will not become granite again. It becomes rhyolite. So the conclusion with this, I would have to say, is granite was one of, if not the only, original created rock formed almost, if not entirely, instantaneously and has been here since the beginning. Moving on. Verse 3, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. Day 2, and God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. Well, if you don't know, firmament means atmosphere. Clearly, we can look up and see that we do not have water above our atmosphere today. This and many, many other things have led many creation scientists to believe in what's called the canopy theory. The canopy theory states that in the beginning when God created the earth, there was a layer of water or much more, like, much more likely ice above the atmosphere. This would do a few things. This would block out harmful UV rays and add air pressure. These are two powerful factors that allowed, allowed people to live in their 900s like recorded in the book of Genesis. And animals too for that matter, and they didn't just live longer, they got bigger. Now, you, there have been a lot of fossils of animals and people, not, not so much people, but and plants too, of things that are found that are just enormous, but you won't see that in, you know, on the news because that contradicts evolution, of course. But let's take a look at just a handful of my favorites here. A three-foot tarantula, six-foot salamander, eight-foot centipede, 18-inch cockroach, 18-foot rhino, 50-inch dragonfly, you don't want to hit that one going 70 miles an hour, 80-foot shark, <laughs> this puts jaws to shame, 11-and-a-half-foot oysters weighing 600 pounds. These oysters are amazing because they're, they're found on top of mountains in the closed position, petrified. Something interesting about these about oysters, when they die, they open almost immediately. The muscles relax, the shell opens up. So tell me, how do you find petrified oysters in a closed position, this big, on top of mountains, all over the world? I keep this in the back of your mind. It'll make sense as I keep going. Now to look at a couple examples of people. This is a giant thumb bone from a pre-flood man. If I remember correctly, this one they say they found the grave of Noah. They found it near Ararat, where the ark landed. I don't know if it's true, but regardless, this guy was big. This random skeleton, I don't know who it was, but he's pretty big. <laughs> the, 
this one, this is amazing. It says he or she stood between 15 and 20 feet tall. Now the Bible says there were giants in the earth in those, those days. I would agree. I, th I think that, I believe it. <laughs> so if you don't want to, so that's, that's, that's a pretty good amount of evidence right there. But if you don't believe the creation scientists, take a look at this article that, was, that came out just about a year ago now. It says, it says that the primitive earth may have had a shield of water around its atmosphere for, secular scientists, by the way, did I say that? It said that the w primitive earth may have had a shield of water around its atmosphere to block the UV rays. They say this because they know how harmful UV rays are to, to evolution, but I'm not worried because that's one of many hurdles they need to cross. But the point is, if you won't believe a creation scientist, believe a cr secular scientist is possible. Now, from a historical perspective, Flavius Josephus wrote in his book, after this on the second day, he placed the, whole, placed the heaven over the whole world and separated it from the other parts, and he determined it should stand by itself. He also placed a crystalline firmament around it and put it together in a manner, manner agreeable to the earth, and et cetera, et cetera. So that is, that's probably the highlights, at least, of why I believe the canopy theory. There are creation scientists that do not believe the canopy theory, like Walt Brown was on my list earlier. He doesn't. And he says there are, there are two major reasons that he doesn't believe them, if I understood correctly. He says the canopy would cause the greenhouse effect, logically, and it would need to be spinning in order to stay above the earth. Here's my solution. I'm not a scientist, not a, I, well, let me rephrase. I don't have a degree. I'm nobody special. I just like to think about it a lot. So here's my solution. Hot air rises. Yes? Agreed? Okay. The hot air would rise to the canopy where the wind would be obviously strongest right next to it. So the hot air would, first of all, it would hit the canopy. The canopy is incredibly cold, probably negative two or three hundred up that high. And that would cool it off a little, but that's not enough. Then it would get caught up in the wind. The wind would cool it down and circulate it, making a nearly, nearly uniform planetary climate. Sounds sounds like a perfect creation to me. And I believe, again, not a scientist, but I believe the winds would probably stay up higher near the canopy rather than down near the Earth for, well, for one, logically, to me, it seems that the air up high is thinner. We know that. So it seems to me that the, that, that the wind would just die down sooner with less air there. And whether or not that's true, it's also entirely possible that there were something like jet streams up there, maybe even an entire network of jet streams that kept this air circulating. I don't know, it's not there anymore. I can't really, can't go look at it, but these are my thoughts. If anyone sees any holes in them, please let me know. I, I'd like to know before I tell to too many more people. <laughs> anyway, back to Genesis. Verse seven, and God made the firmament and divided, it, divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. And God called the firmament heaven, and the evening and the morning were the second day. Day three. And God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the water called he seas, and God saw that it was good. And God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth. And it was so. And the earth brought forth grass, the herb yielding seed after his kind, the tree yielding fruit, whose seed was in itself after his kind, and God saw that it was good. And the evening and the morning were the third day. This is absolutely amazing, but quite frankly, I have nothing to say about it. It's just in order to keep things in context. <laughs> day four. And God said, let there, let there be lights in the firmament of heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be for lights in the firmament of heaven to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. A lot, the problem here is a lot of people read over that and they don't really think about how big this is. See, you don't even really know exactly what I'm talking about right now, do you? He made the stars also. Just in case you don't understand the magnitude of these five little words, I'd just like to show you this, this short video.
And as if that doesn't blow your mind enough, there are 70 sextillion of them out there. <laughs> and the Bible says he tells the number of the stars, he calls them all by their names. We have a big God. Anyway, back to Genesis, verse 17. And God set them in the firmament, firmament of heaven to give light upon the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And the evening and the morning were the fourth day. So to summarize, day four, God created the sun, the moon, and the stars. Evolution teaches nearly the polar opposite. That first, the stars were created with the sun. And shortly, shortly after that, the, the earth was created and somewhere in there the moon fits in. We, they, they never really figured that out. But... um. This is just one of one of many opposites between the evolution and creation theories. They're completely incompatible. But uh, keep an eye out. You'll see you see a lot of them. It's, it's quite interesting. Anyway, day five. And God said, let the, earth, let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life, and the fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. Another contrast right there. The birds were the, one of the first things created. Evolution says it was the last to evolve. Verse 21, And God created great whales and every living creature that moveth which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind, every winged fowl after his kind, and God saw that it was good. And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters in the seas and let the fowl multiply in the earth. And the evening and the morning were the fifth day. And God said, Let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind, cattle and creeping thing and beast of the earth after his kind. And it was so. And God made the beast of the earth after his kind and the cattle after their kind and every living thing that creepeth upon the earth after his kind. And God saw that it was good. Do you notice the theme here? After his kind, after their kind, after its kind, this is this is scientific. This is what we see, what we observe today. A cat will produce a cat, a dog will produce a dog. You can do that with any animal. It's going to reproduce after its kind. This this is proven. Evolution theory, the contrary, states that given enough time, a species can gain genetic complexity and become something other than its kind. This has never been observed and is genetically impossible for something to gain complexity. It can lose complexity, causing speciation, but not gain. Anyway, verse 26, And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over all the cattle, and over, every, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. And God blessed them and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. Let's stop. There are people that, because of this verse, says replenish, it says, they say that there had to be an entire world before this that had to be destroyed and refilled because the word replenish today, if you look it up, says refill. The King James, the first English translation of the Bible, was translated in 1611. In 1611, the word replenish meant to fill only to fill. In 1650, a second definition of the word was added by a guy named Francis Bacon. I, I remember the name because it's just awesome. But uh, the second definition was to fill again, to refill. This is the oldest picture of a dictionary I can find. Refill or replenish. First definition is fill. Second definition is recover former fullness. Moving forward in time, we have 1892. The primary definition now is to refill, and the secondary definition is to fill. Moving forward again, 1989, the only definition is refill. The dictionary has left out what used to be the, the only meaning of the word. You see, God promised to preserve his word. He did not promise to preserve our interpretation of it. How would you interpret this verse? And do you have respect to him that weareth the gay clothing? That's not what they meant when they wrote it. Anyway, Revelation 21.1 says, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. We're still on the first earth. There will be another one. Not yet. Anyway, back to Genesis again. And replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. Let me say that again. Replen re replenish the earth, subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. Forget animal rights. They're here for us. <laughs> Got to be a little controversial. Verse 29, And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb-bearing seed which is, which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree which is on the... Uh, 
which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed, that to you it shall be for meat. And to every beast of the earth, and to every fowl of the air, and to every, everything that creepeth upon the earth wherein there is life, I have given you, given you every green herb for meat. And it was so. You see, when God made the world, everything was vegetarian. That, that's a perfect creation. Nothing had to die for another thing to survive. Verse 31, And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good in the evening and the morning with the sixth day. Very good. In six days, God created everything, and not just the everything we have now. We're living in a junkyard now. He created a perfect creation without sin, without death, without struggle, and without pain. It was perfect. See, people always ask, if God is, God is love, why are we living in a horrible world? He didn't make it that way. And let's see exactly what happened to ruin it. Part two, the curse. Okay, going to Genesis 2, 16. And the Lord God commanded of the man, say, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Jump ahead again to Genesis 3, 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. <laughs> He's been a liar since the start. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Ye shall be as gods. That is exactly the same philosophy that the evolution theory teaches. It says we started off as a slime on a rock and we're evolving to be bigger and better and stronger and faster and smarter, some of us. And one day we will conquer the planet, the solar system, the universe, anything we can find until we rule everything. I, I, I disagree. Verse 6, And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her and he did eat. This is where sin entered the world and death by sin. Interesting point here too. 1 Timothy 2.14, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Adam knew exactly what he was doing when he did it. He chose consciously to follow his wife because he knew his wife was going to have to be punished. He chose to follow his wife instead of his God. A stupid romantic, I guess. I'd, I'd like to slap him. Anyway, verse 9, and the Lord God called, called unto Adam and said unto them, where art thou? And he said, he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. He said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded that thou shouldest not eat? And the man said, The woman whom thou gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. They're playing the blame game. No one wants responsibility, of course. Verse 14, And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly thou shalt go, and thus shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. Interesting food for thought here. Before this, the serpent was not the snake we have today. I don't know what it was, because it's not anymore, but interesting to think about. Verse 15, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. And unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow shalt thou bring forth children, and thy desire to be, shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Woman's pain, or woman's punishment, two things. Pain in childbirth, which I've never experienced, and I doubt I ever will, but it, to me, it sounds like punishment. And the second thing, sorry ladies, man's in charge. I didn't write the book, I, I like it, but... I'm sorry, you shouldn't eat the fruit. That's all I can say. <laughs> and unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree which, of which I commanded, saying, I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake, and sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns and thistles shalt it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face thou shalt eat bread, till thou return to the ground, for out of it thou wast taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. Man's punishment, we're still doing today, you have to work to eat. It's, before this, in the garden, you could, you were hungry, you go get a fruit, you go do whatever you want to do. Now you have to work just to survive. 
And notice it says, for thy sake. God knows that with sin in us, if we sit around with nothing to do all day, we're going to screw up. It's our nature. And this is, this is the problem with some, not all, don't get mad, people that get, get welfare. They sit around, do nothing, and get paid to do it. So they get in trouble. It's our nature. We, we screw up. Another thing here is it says, notice it says, thorns and thistles. I've had a lot of druggies come to me and say, because God made it, it's good for me. The thorns and thistles were specifically designed to be a burden, a curse, a bad thing for us. I know it doesn't say thorns, thistles, and pot, but put two and two together. Anyway, part three, the catastrophe. Genesis 6, verse 12, And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt. For all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me. The earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make thee an ark of gopher wood. Room shall thou make it. He goes on for the rest of the chapter to talk about how to build a boat. It's not important. Genesis 7, verse 10, And it came to pass after seven days, not seven days right after that, but whatever that the waters of the flood were upon the earth in the 600th year of Noah's life in the se second month and the 17th day of the month were the, the same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up and the windows of heaven were opened. And the rain was upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights. Of course. Well, why did it rain for 40 days? What are the fountains of the great deep and what are the windows of heaven? I'm going to tell you my theory, which most, most theories of the flood are really quite similar, but there are some minor differences. I've looked at a lot of different theories, and I've pieced together what I think is probably the most, most likely. It answers the most questions without being too ridiculous. But let's, before we do that, let's establish some ground rules here. Psalm 24.2 says, He hath founded it upon the seas and established it upon the floods. When God made the earth, there was the core, then subterranean waters, on top of that, then the crust above that, then the atmosphere and the canopy on top. And we still have remnants of this today. For example, we have vents shooting water up into the bottom of the ocean. Where does water have to be coming from to be going up into the bottom of the ocean? Even lower. Another thing, Isaiah 45, 18 says, the, He formed the earth to be inhabited. A planet mostly covered in water like we have today is not it's a lot of wasted real estate in fact with with all the the oceans the deserts the arctics everything we have now the only about three percent of the earth is really habitable for us i don't think that's how we made it so here's my theory it's that's no, it's not my theory this is the theory i believe you may have some minor disagreements but this is this is what i found to be the most most logical <laughs> one or more probably more very large I'll call it an ice ball because I think it'd probably be too big to be considered a comet. Flew into our solar system. The comets we can measure today have a temperature of about negative 300, negative 400 degrees. They're really cold. As they came in, the fragments would have got caught up in orbit around the big, larger gas plant, gaseous planets, creating the rings around all four. Yes, there are rings around all four. Looking from the outside, outside of the solar system in, we have first Neptune. I'm pretty sure this picture is exaggerated, but regardless, those are what the rings look like. Uranus, Uranus's rings are so faint, you can't really see them with your eye, but if you take a picture like this with the infrared, they become quite clear, and no, the picture is not slanted. Uranus is very unique. All the other planets, while orbiting, spin like a top. Uranus rolls like a ball, which contradicts evolution theory in many ways, but that's another talk for another day. Then, of course, there's Saturn, and I don't need to explain Saturn. We've all seen Saturn. And Jupiter's, Jupiter's very faint rings, but they are visible if you take a picture like this from the back, aiming towards the sun for the light to come through. You can see the very, very faint rings. Now to the terrestrial planets, we have Mars. Mars, you have heard, I'm sure, a lot about evidence for water on Mars. And there's a lot of ways there could be water on Mars. There's a lot of ways that the features, features that look like evidence of water could be formed without water. But here's a, here's a thought. Perhaps these things were formed because the raining down ice would have hit, hit Mars, melted into water, water does what water does, and then would have evaporated very quickly because of Mars' very thin atmosphere. Uh, next planet would be us, we'll skip that for a minute, and then there's Venus. 
that's all we see of Venus from the outside. But you can get, we, we did get pictures underneath the clouds, it looks like that. Venus is the hottest planet we have. It's not the closest to the sun, but it is the hottest one we have because of the very thick clouds. My thought, and they also say Venus has too few craters compared to the planets. I don't know how they figure that exactly, but I'll go with it. My theory here is the ice raining down from this, this barrage of ice balls, we'll say. Some of it touched down, I'm sure, but most of it probably would have burned up in the atmosphere, which is close to 1,000 degrees on a regular day. Looking at the last planet, there's Mercury. Mercury is a, it's, it's absolutely pelted in craters. And we don't know why. We never see it get struck by anything. Interesting. Anyway, back to Earth. Pretty, pretty familiar place. What I think would, what I think would have happened here is, the, as the ice came by, it would have the fragments would have broken off. It would have smashed into the canopy, breaking the windows of heaven. The ice would have rained down and broken apart in our thicker atmosphere, become snow and hail. Very cold ice is very easily statically charged. It would be picked up into our magnetic field, which at the time was much, much stronger than it is today, and primarily attracted to the poles. Hence why we have giant ice caps, and at the time were much larger. This started the ice age. We'll get back to that in a minute. Now, the, the, these comets, ice balls, whatever that it came by, they, this is why I say they had to be huge, because at this point, I believe, is when when the Earth tilted. Before this, I believe it probably was straight up and down, causing the you know clean, clean climate we had. But here in Genesis 8:22, after the flood, it talks about it talks about what talks about the seasons for the first time. While the Earth remaineth, seed time and harvest, and cold and heat, and summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease. Interesting. See, I think what would have happened is these things would have had been big enough to come by gravitationally pull on the Earth, tilting it, and I think it had to have been from gravity because if it would have struck, A, no matter how much water there was from the flood, we would have probably seen a mark, and B, our orbit around the sun is still nearly circular. It, we weren't struck by anything that big. Or that hard, I don't know, depending on how you want to look at it. As the ice hit down, it would have it would have been cold enough to crack open the crust of the Earth, creating the fault lines. We see them all over the planet. Like, for example, this one, the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, is a gigantic gash that goes from pole to pole down, down the side of the planet. These, this cracking of the crust would release the water beneath the crust, the subterranean chambers. This would, this is where the vast majority of the floodwaters came from, the fountains of the Great Deep breaking open right here. This, the flood didn't, the flood didn't really come from rain. Very little water came from rain. It mostly came from underneath the earth. And as I said before, we came back to the Ice Age. Now, the Ice Age started at the beginning of the flood, I believe. And the Ice Age froze a lot of animals. It froze, you know, lions, tigers, and bears, oh my, whatever you can think of, really. But the most famous, of course, is mammoths. Let's take a look at some of these mammoths. Some of them are found still standing up. They have undigested food still in their stomach and teeth. They died from suffocation, but there's no water in the lungs. And then they have small ice crystals in the blood. This all indicates that they probably float they had to have frozen in less than five hours. In order to freeze something as big as a mammoth in five hours requires, conveniently, about negative 300 degrees. That's really cold. It does not get that cold on Earth. The coldest temperature ever recorded from National Geographic is negative 129. That's, that's, that's cold. That's not negative 300 cold. That's not freeze a full mammoth in five hours cold. Okay, back to Genesis. And the waters prevailed and were greatly increased upon the earth, and the ark went up upon the face of the waters. And the waters prevailed exceedingly upon the earth, and, and above, yeah, and all the high hills that were under the whole, whole heaven were covered. Fifteen cubits upward did the waters prevail, and the mountains were covered. There are people that believe that the flood of Noah, that believe and teach that the flood of Noah was a local flood in his little valley. It didn't phase the rest of the world. That's what they believe. I don't buy it. Verse 24, and the waters prevailed upon the, face, uh, upon the earth for 150 days, that's five months. Meaning the waters continued to rise for five months. Another thing that says that it couldn't have been from the rain. While the earth is totally submerged in water, the moon's still out there doing its moon thing. It doesn't know or care that the earth is underwater. The moon causes the tides 
Today the tides don't don't do too much. They you know minor changes, not a big deal. With no continents to stop the tidal changes, the change would be about 200 feet every six and a half hours. This much moving water would cause incredible amount of sedimentation and stratification, basically meaning the sediment moved around, actually sorted the sediments, creating the layers that we see today, mixed in, by the way, with all the dead plants, animals, and anything else that was around. This is, this is why we have layers all over the earth. These are not, not pages in the history book of life. They're, that's a, an, another talk for another day again. But take a look at this. You can find bent rock layers all the layers together are bent. This, this tells us that all these layers are formed together and bent while the rock was still soft. If it bent afterwards, the rock would crack. If they were laid on top of, on top of each other one at a time, they wouldn't look like that. They'd, they'd level out real quick. These are not hard to find. I found that one. I took a picture. I thought it was pretty cool. Now you've probably heard in high school that the geologic column proves, proves evolution. Each of these layers has, was, represents an age. It had a different species that lived there. It's a joke for several reasons, but this is, I think, the, the best nail in the coffin. If this was real anywhere, it would be 100 miles thick. The Earth's crust in its thickest point is only about 30 miles thick, and its thinnest point under the ocean is about two. <laughs> there is no geologic column. Another interesting point, there are things like petrified trees found all over the world connecting all these rock layers. This tree is fascinating. The bottom is coalified, the center is petrified, and the top is coalified again. This tree did not stand there for millions of years while the layers formed around it. It falls over in about 10 at best. Back to Genesis 8.3. And the waters returned from off the earth continually, and after the end of the 150 days were the waters abated. And the ark rested, upon, rested in the seventh month and the seventeenth day of the month upon the mountains of Ararat. And the waters decreased continually until the 10th month, and in the 10th month and the first day of the month were the tops of the mountains seen. And the next seven verses, it talks about Noah sent out a bird to look for land. We've probably all heard that from the children's story. Verse 13, it came to pass in the 600th, 600th and first year, in the first month and the first day of the month, the waters were dried up from off the earth. And Noah removed the covering off the ark and looked, and behold, the face of the ground was dry. And in the second month, on the seventh and twentieth day of the month, was the earth dried. You see, what happened here is, in the beginning of the flood, the tectonic plates were formed by the cracking of the fault lines. These plates would have been moving around, shifting, bumping into each other, moving around very freely, by the way, with the lubricating water beneath them. And at this point, they would have stopped, they would have slammed into each other, they would have compressed and buckled in earthquakes, same thing we have today. The high places would have rose up in the mountain ranges and continents, the low places would be deep ocean basins. The water, logically, would run into the low place, creating 70% of the planet being covered in water. Verse 15, And God spake unto Noah, saying, Go forth out of the ark, thou and thy wife and thy son's wife with thee. At this point, the ice age is still in full effect. It was a lot lower than it is now. We'd be very cold right now. And there's, there's no question there was an ice age. We can see features of it like this, these grooves in the rock from the glaciers moving, terminal and lateral moraines from basically meaning just dirt piles pushed around by moving glaciers. You can find these. These aren't hard. But take a look at the map of the, this map of the Earth. You can see, if you look closely, there are parts that are very deep and parts that are not very deep. Zoom in just at this place, for example. If the water level is just a little bit lower, you could walk from Australia to any of those islands and back to mainland China. It would, have all, it would have all been connected. So what would have happened is the the glaciers would have been slowly melting back after after the flood, and probably still are. That's probably what all this this junk about global warming is. It's a natural effect of the flood. The ice would have been melting back. The water level would rise, disconnecting all the continents. People ask, how did how did the people and the animals get off the off the ark and cover the whole world? They walked. How else did they do it? This, this also explains why we find underwater cities. They were not built underwater. Uh, Genesis 9.1, And God blessed Noah and, said unto, and his sons and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth, and the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth and upon every fowl of the air, upon, upon all that moveth upon the earth and upon all the fishes of the sea, and to your hand they are delivered. Before this, animals were not afraid of man. 
after this, they are, and I think I know why. Verse 3, every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you, even as the green herb I have given you all things. Now we can eat them. I'd be afraid too. We'll jump ahead a little bit, Genesis 9, 12. And God said, this is the token, token of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. I do set my bow in the cloud. It shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. And it shall come to pass when I bring a cloud over the earth that the bow shall be seen in the cloud. And I will remember my covenant which is between me and you and every living, every living creature of all flesh. And the water shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh. Real quick point, verse 15 also disproves a local flood because we've had local floods. And he said there wouldn't be. This is something to think about. This is a highly debated topic. There, it may not have ever rained before the flood. It may have been, the planet may have been watered by springs, fed from the subterranean waters, feeding the lakes and the rivers and all bodies of water. And also possibly mention, also possibly a mist that came up from the earth mentioned in Genesis 2, 6, which I did not read. You see, in order for there to be rain, there's, there must be what's called condensation nuclei, which are tiny, tiny particles in the air. There needs to, they need to be there for water to condense around, otherwise it, would, it, it can't condense, it's just how it is. Condensation nuclei are typically less than 0 0.0001 millimeter in diameter. They are very small. And they're generally caused by three main things. Volcanic emissions, airborne sea salt, and phytoplankton and our own pollution, but that's really irrelevant. But um, all these things are a product of the flood. The volca volcanoes were formed from tectonic activity. There were, there were probably not huge, you know, there definitely weren't huge seas. There, there may not have been any seas before the flood, and if they were, there's good evidence to believe that they weren't salty anyway. And any amount of water that there was would not be enough, the, the phytoplankton live in the water, that would not be enough of them to really put, in, put much in, up in the air. <clears throat> Therefore, I believe scientifically that it, it seems like it couldn't have rained before the flood. I'm, I'm not 100% sure on that, but I'm pretty close. If you, uh, if you have any things to, to contradict this, I'd like to hear it. Honestly, I'm very interested. But, but yeah, I believe scientifically it could not, have formed, or could not have rained before the flood. And this would allow the first rainbow mentioned in verse 13 that would give it a special significance. If you're 600 years old and you've never seen a rainbow before, it would mean something. So this is the creation story in a nutshell. I, I like that. I hope I've helped you to give, give you a greater understanding of the topic. I realize there's a lot of things I didn't get to cover, and I do hope in the future to have more teachings about more specific subjects. All right, that's it for me then. Um, oh, one more thing, sorry. Uh, if you, if you, anyone here wants me to come speak a message like this or just a one-on-one -on -one personal, you know, we'll talk about it or anything like that, there's uh, contact information on the program that was handed to you on the way in. Uh, there's a sign-up sheet for don DVDs for $5 a piece on the back table, and if you feel very generous and are led to donate to this so we can continue to speak on things like this and hopefully travel the nation at one point, there's a red box back there for donations if you're ever so kind. All right, intermission.